A perfect midsummer evening at an airfield in the East Midlands of England. In fact, an historic one, RAF wittering near Stamford. From bases like this, since 1918, the Royal Air Force has maintained its skywatch over Britain and her interests overseas. But now, in the 25th year of the NATO alliance, how does the service fulfill that role? In this program, we shall see something of its equipment and its capabilities, from the pupil pilot on his first flight to the terrifying destructive power of live weapon attacks on Salisbury Plain. And we shall also see something of those other ships and aircraft on which the Air Force keeps a watchful eye in its round-the-clock readiness. But of course, for any of this to happen, men and machines must become airborne. And on the runway here at Wittering tonight, they're lined up and ready to go. The first to take off, two Jaguars, the newest aircraft in service with the RAF. The Anglo-French replacement for the Rolls-Royce powered American Phantoms, first delivered May 73. The first Jaguar squadron has just been formed on March the 29th, to be precise, number 54 at Lossimouth. Two Buccaneers from number 12 squadron, RAF Honington. This uh, subsonic, all-weather, low-level, long-range maritime strike two-seater, a key aircraft in the RAF's new responsibilities towards the Royal Navy. Mark III from 5 and 11 squadrons at Binbrook, the RAF standard all-weather, twice the speed of sound, single-seater interceptor. In service since the early 60s, still playing a key role in Britain's air defence. The Lightning takes off, climbs supersonically and accelerates to twice the speed of sound in three and a half minutes. Four Vulcans Mark II, the RAF's long-range heavy bomber and the world's first large delta-wing aircraft, now adapted to the all-weather ultra-low-level attack, literally following the ground contours under the enemy radars. Four Vulcans airborne within the minute. Beside me, Group Captain Ray Davenport from Headquarters Strike Command, himself a former Vulcan pilot. This aeroplane is a joy to fly. It has lots of power and the ability to carry a very large weapon load a very long way. It can, of course, carry nuclear weapons and it operates equally well at both high and low levels. It's a proven performer that still has a very important part to play in our defense arrangements. Now, two Harriers from number one squadron here at Wittering, the world's first fixed-wing vertical and stall aircraft, built by Hawker Siddeley, powered by a single Rolls-Royce Bristol Pegasus vectored thrust turbofan. And tonight, we are to see the Harrier for the first time on television in its photographic reconnaissance role. These two are airborne for the RAF College at Cranwell to photograph a formation of aircraft on the ground, which we shall see at the conclusion of the program. And also, at this moment, airborne and approaching Birmingham are two Phantoms of Number 2 Squadron flying in from Laarbruch in West Germany on a photographic reconnaissance mission. And this is their target, target time 8.20 at our Birmingham television studios at Pebble Mill after a 500-mile trip on which they will have photographed their local church clock at Pizza and Cologne Cathedral before their final run-in here. Now, this is live this evening, June the 21st, remember? So if you live anywhere near Pebble Mill, you can rush out into the garden and see the aeroplanes. 20.20 the target time, 18 seconds to go. And all these pictures we hope to show you before the end of the program. Ten seconds to go. The Phantoms coming up to the conclusion of a 500-mile trip across Europe. And here they are, two seconds to go, as they line up on the target and shoot their film. 
bang over the top and bang on time to the very split second led by Wing Commander Bunny Warren of the OCF number two squadron whom we'll be talking to later when he lands here with those photographs. Well, we've already seen a lot of flying and to the Royal Air Force or indeed any civil airliner uh, any aircraft on the ground is a liability. Consequently, the role of the ground maintenance crews and the speed with which they can complete what is known as an operational turnaround is as vital to the efficiency of a fighting squadron as that of the air crews. These two Phantoms from number six night ground attack squadron have just landed from an operational sortie and we are to see them change crews, rearm and refuel. The clock has started. The target time is nine minutes. Already we see the fuel lines being got into readiness. They will take on 1,000 gallons of fuel, say 10,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds in each of those under wing tanks. There you see the two 1,000 pound standard retard bombs to be loaded onto one of the aircraft. And already a hive of activity. There's a leapus flare being lifted into position. Each of those de uh, generates five million candle power. You remember I told you that this squadron were night sortie specialists. The team of uh, 10 technicians and uh, a chief technician working away at their allotted tasks. As we looked on for a moment from our airborne camera in the RAF Puma helicopter flown by Flight Lieutenant Dick Langworthy. And there you see the two chief technicians controlling each of the crews, checking off the points. The uh, Vulcan gun under the belly will be loaded with 800 pounds of ammunition. But now we go further afield, we'll be back here to see the conclusion of this exercise. And remember that nine minutes was the target time for a nine and a half ton load to go onto each of the aeroplanes. But now, as I said, we go further afield. To maintain today's efficient defensive skywatch over Britain, the Royal Air Force uses and is part of the complex radar and communications network of NATO. The UK air defense region is a vast area stretching from southwest of Land's End to Iceland and Norway. Approaching aircraft located by the constantly scanning radar show up as luminous traces on the controller's display screen. Hello, hello, 002, North, November Lima, Mike, Hotel 55, Zombie, not allocated, strength 2, height 360, speed 300. The Norwegian controller tracks the approaching aircraft continuously. He decides that they are unidentifiable and must be investigated. He passes his information to a radar station in Scotland and also to Strike Command headquarters. And he updates his computer. Zombie splitting. Southwest, November Lima, Lima Hotel, 1-2. Zombie, Chilo, Chilo, 001. Uh, Luchers, Luchers from Buck and Telebrief. Uh, possibility of trade. Now crossing 40 degrees east, initial report, strength 3, heading 270, speed, height unknown. John, we have some live traffic. Right, the channels will be 1 and 5. The radar plot is taken up by the UK radar station and at strike command. On the large topographical display, the traces show clearly off the northwest coast of Norway. Mom controller? Scramble at mission 5-1, Dragonfly, call Bucken on pre-brief. Dragonfly is the Victor tanker to support the intercepting fighters. On the topographical display, the two traces rapidly approach the north of Scotland and show no sign of changing course. Bucking controller, scramble. And at RAF Lucas, by the Firth of Forth, two Phantoms are scrambled to intercept. In very few minutes, they are airborne.
WREF girl plotters in the operations room move the arrows indicating the position of both zombies and the intercepting phantoms. Now the phantom rendezvous on course with the Victor tanker and tops up his fuel to replace what has been used on takeoff and the climb to height, thereby extending his range by many hundreds of miles. Distance between the interceptor and his target is now closing fast, around a thousand miles an hour or more. Radar surveillance continues. The fighters are turned onto a course parallel with their quarry. I one, your mission to intercept, identify and shadow. There he is, a bear of the Russian long-range air force, a not infrequent visitor, and by no means unknown to us at Strike Command. Mission 5-1, you are to return to base. Your pigeons point Charlie, 230-190. There you have seen the argument in favor of an air defense system which includes manned aircraft. A missile cannot conduct an investigation of an intruder without destroying it. But the manned interceptor must also be capable of destroying if necessary. And this Phantom is on a training sortie which will end in destruction. Its quarry, an old meteor jet being flown by remote control. The Phantom pilot is guided to his target by radar. His weapons on this occasion, two Sparrow air-to-air -air missiles. A direct hit. The meteor's tail is blown clean off. The Phantom and the Sparrow are a proven deadly combination in the confident hands of a trained crew. And there we see the four Sparrow missiles back here at Wittering have been loaded onto their firing racks in readiness for the next Phantom sortie as this live operational turnaround approaches completion. Remember, nine minutes was the target time. And there, an incredible shot of an incredible weapon. The Vulcan gun, a super six-barrel Gatling, electronically controlled, firing 6,000 rounds a minute. And uh, that, as I told you, has already been loaded with 800 pounds of ammunition. Two canisters of cluster bombs. Each canister contains scores of bomblets, and each one of those is fiercely destructive. Twenty seconds to go, and the job is completed. We'll be looking out for the marshals, SAC Collins and SAC Richards, to wave the first phantom out. And here we've got, oh, more than ten seconds to go to the completion of a complete operational turnaround, fully armed, fully uh, fueled. Out they go. To us watching perhaps an impressive performance. To you, Group Captain Davenport, standard practice, I presume? Indeed, uh, you well know, Raymond, the threat to this country is measured in minutes and seconds. And therefore our response must be similarly timed. This is standard operating procedure, and no surprise either to me or indeed to the turnaround crews themselves. And now back from their photographic reconnaissance of our Pebble Mill Studios in Birmingham, the Phantoms of Number 2 Squadron flown in from Larbrook, Germany. Wing Commander Bunny Warren, the CO, leading in the pair, and you see the Harrier coming in just behind. You remember I explained the, that he had a, a photo mission 
down to uh, the RAF College at Cranwell to see a formation on the ground, which we shall see in the sky here in this very same frame of sky at the conclusion of the program. But now, the operational photographs which have been taken by these aeroplanes are being brought to base for very high-speed processing and subsequent analysis. And you have been able to time for yourselves how long it has all taken. This Phantom has come 500 miles and more, photographed three targets, the last one a precision attack right on the very second, and now landing at the end of the runway with under the center of the belly the camera and the film. And here's the Harrier already landed, squadron leader Jack Pugh making a stall approach, landing on the grass and now taxiing straight up to deliver his photographs. You see the, uh, the uh, uh, specially constructed undercarriage of the Harrier with those wide outriggers making light of the indifferent ground well off the runway. This is one of the many uh, capabilities of the Harrier which make it such an extraordinary aeroplane. Can almost go up steps by the look of it. And now squadron leader Jack Pugh's task almost completed as he taxis right up to the actual, the Air Transportable Reconnaissance Exploitation Laboratory. There it is, those two boxes. Effectively, a highly mobile darkroom with trimmings. There the film will be uh, processed, printed, and enlarged. And as I said, we will see the finished result now being unloaded from the uh, uh, camera in the nose. Now, rarely in the history of aviation are the Phantom here, which I was going to say rarely in the history of aviation has an aeroplane been more versatile than the Phantom we are looking at. And there you see the uh, camera bubble where the Vulcan gun was under the night sortie Phantom, which we were looking at just now. And also rarely in the history of aviation has it been true to say of a single aeroplane, this has added a new dimension. Of the Harrier, this is demonstrably true. No aircraft before has been so able to disappear into the landscape and then spring out of it and into action. Versatility is, of course, the keynote of the modern Air Force. And out comes Captain Tom Plank of the United States Air Force, here with one squadron on an exchange posting. The Harrier has, of course, made an enormous impact in the United States. It's the first British military aeroplane bought by the Americans since the First World War. So out goes the first Harrier from cover for an operational takeoff, but there are other ways to hide a Harrier. An inflatable hangar, easily camouflaged, of course, 50 feet by 30 feet by 15 feet high, self-supporting, it has its own compressor, electrically powered uh, from the mains by batteries or a generator. And in case it may look flimsy, I can assure you it's been tested and has withstood a force eight gale, let alone the jet wash of a Harrier. It is, of course, a highly portable structure. Speed of erection being one of its many qualities affords very good protection, not only for the aircraft, but for crew working on it. And, of course, it could uh, be erected anywhere in the world. And out comes the second Harrier from that high. But the art of war is improvisation. As was quoted to me last night by the station commander here, Group Captain Ian Kepi. And uh, in the operational field, a double wall of hay bales might fall to hand and could be usefully pressed into service to provide a good hide and a lot of protection for a concealed aircraft. But 
if you go down in the woods today, you're sure of a big surprise. And already that wood has contained and subsequently revealed a number of startling surprises, but none more than that. The classic Harrier capability to take off vertically from a clearing no wider than its own narrow wingspan. But the Harrier's hides need not necessarily be in the countryside. We hear a lot nowadays about the urban gorilla. Well, how about an aircraft as an urban gorilla? This sequence was recently filmed on Operation Big T, in which the Harriers of Number One Squadron really set the aviation world by the ears. aim of uh, this exercise was to evaluate high intensity operations in support of an army brigade under armored attack. Twelve Harriers from number one squadron flew 364 sorties in three days. Serviceability was excellent. In fact one Harrier flew 45 consecutive sorties with no unserviceability and all in very unusual environments. Well, the environments uh, could scarcely be more unusual than those we have just seen, but Flight Lieutenant Steve Jennings and Flight Lieutenant Chris Marshall, both instructors of 223 OCU, now bring their Harriers in to demonstrate the unique air handling capabilities of this aircraft. Slowing down from about 230 knots, a gradual transition right down to the hover. You see the astonishing maneuverability at zero forward speed and how the nose is brought up to finally bring the aeroplane to a halt standing on the plume of its own jet. Now here's an interesting quote. The aeroplane won't amount to a dam until they get a machine that will act like a hummingbird, go straight up, go forward, go backwards, come straight down and alight like a hummingbird. It isn't easy, but somebody is going to do it. And the prophet who wrote that was no less than Thomas Edison, 1847 to 1931. The two aeroplanes at the hover. And remember, as I told you, 110 of these airplanes have been bought by the Americans for the U.S. Marine Corps. Three squadrons are already equipped, and one of them will soon go overseas. The vertical descent and land. But now, as a result of recent political decisions, the world's first Beestol fighting airplane, invented and built in Britain, and first in service in Britain with the Royal Air Force, is to be further developed, not here, but in the United States. Nevertheless, information over their home base, the Harriers of Number One Squadron, who have made and continue to make aviation history. But no matter how advanced its equipment, the efficiency of any Air Force is ultimately dependent on the capability of its pilots. And in this respect, no Air Force has been better served than the RAF by its training command. For many years, one small but important source of embryo pilots has been the University Air Squadrons. This bulldog is from the University of London Air Squadron based at Abingdon. At the controls, one of the instructors, Flight Lieutenant Punkett, his pupil, Stephen Wilkin, an undergraduate reading mechanical engineering at study. A big moment for him, his uh, very first RAF instructional flight, and we can eavesdrop on conversation in the cockpit. Right, Wilkin, here we are. Everyone on your first flight. Yes, sir. Very impressive, isn't it? What we'll, what we'll do is we'll climb straight up in the runway direction. And that really was his very first flight. Yes, sir, very impressive, he said. But now, higher up the scale in every sense, a jet provost, the workhorse of training command, which takes on where the bulldog leaves off. After about 80 hours on bulldogs and another 80 on these, the pupil is a pretty proficient pilot with aerobatic experience, some formation flying, and, of course, 
total familiarity with the spin. There you see it from the pilot's point of view. And more important than learning how to spin, how to get out of a spin. They're a classic recovery. And now the pride of training command and specifically Central Flying School of the The Red Arrows, once again under the leadership of squadron leader Ian Dick, AFC, awarded the MBE last Saturday, you'll be pleased to know. Now tonight's sortie is strictly a training flight in the intensive work program leading up to their first public reappearance at the end of July. They've got two new pilots who've only been with them a couple of months, and of course they were grounded in the interests of fuel conservation, which uh, incidentally the Air Force took extremely seriously. But like the great team they are, as you can see, they have not allowed their standards to slip an inch despite the difficulties. As a serving officer, Ray Davenport, this must be a stirring side for you. Uh, indeed it is. Uh, clearly they have not forgotten how to fly during their enforced layoff. They are now in the final stages of their training program, as you said, and it looks to me to be working out very well indeed. And the important thing to remember as we watch them on this occasion specifically is that what we are looking at is the ultimate, perhaps, in applied airmanship, and that this is the product of hours of hard work, teamwork, uh, mutual trust and self-discipline, which is what the Royal Air Force is all about. And nevertheless, great fun at that. We have... Uh, squad leader Ian Dick's RT so we can hear his monosyllabic instructions to the team. the diamond change so smooth that one didn't see the moving of it. And there is Super Concorde, the Red Arrow's Rolling personal in. tribute to the Concorde team, their neighbors at Fairford. This standard of precision flying makes the crowds gasp at air shows wherever the arrows display. But it is symbolic of that other key no function of the service in our defense. And so as the Red Arrows write their inimitable signature across the sky, we go back, as it were, to the end of the beginning to see Flight Lieutenant Plunkett bringing in the Bulldog at the conclusion and of young Stephen Wilkins' baptism of flying the Air Force way. Be an excited young man. Do you see him? Just look over his shoulder there as the Bulldog comes in on short finals land. Listen. Change in the attitude of the aircraft now to fly level with the ground. And And every airman will say, congratulations, lad, and good luck. Now, from training to the maritime role, this Nimrod is from number 201 squadron at Kinloss. Now, the Nimrod is the only all-jet maritime reconnaissance aircraft in the world, and certainly the most advanced. It's a highly complex, self-contained flying ops room 
capable of seeking out and destroying enemy shipping or submarines either by itself or in cooperation with naval forces or other aircraft such as these two buccaneers from number 12 squadron at Honington. But from the Buccaneer, let's go back to the Nimrod. Nimrods conduct routine 12-hour patrols off the shores of Britain, thousands of miles out over the Atlantic, cruising on two of their four Spey 250s at around 180 knots, if necessary, at zero feet. They keep the skywatch over the sea, and this is the type of shipping they keep an eye on. A cash-in-class guided missile armed destroyer. Displacement 4,300 tons. A Cresta one class guided missile cruiser. Displacement 5,140 tons. Speed 34 knots. It carries missiles, anti-submarine weapons and torpedoes. And here, most important of all, a Russian nuclear submarine. A Sverdlov-class cruiser, one of the big fellas at 15,450 tons. Speed, 34 knots. Range, 8,700 miles at 18 knots. This patrol, incidentally, was filmed during the Wit weekend. A Cresta II class guided missile cruiser, displacement 6,000 tons, speed 33 knots, built in Leningrad from 1968 onwards. And finally, a Canon class guided missile destroyer, displacement 4,300 tons, speed 43 knots. And from a patrol over Russian ships at sea to the Nimrod in the sky over a wit wittering. Its onboard computer can deliver a fully automated attack based on information gathered by its almost uncanny sensors. It can, for example, locate a submerged submarine magnetically or by detecting minute traces of diesel fumes. It can seek out and destroy. It is vital in our maritime defense. It is unique in the world. Now joining in partnership, the Lusty Buccaneer, in service with the Royal Navy since the early 60s, now enjoying a new lease of life, and further aircraft are on order for the Royal Air Force. The Royal Air Force now has responsibility for providing land-based maritime strike in support of the NATO navies and this responsibility will increase further. At the start of the program, I promised you live weaponry attacks on Salisbury Plain, and uh, that tank on the skyline is the Vulcan's target. It's surrounded by bunkers in a defensive zone. The yellow tractor there is also surrounded by bunkers, and it is the Jaguar's objective for a low-level bombing attack for this brand new aircraft making its operational debut. It's important to remember, of course, that there is really no substitute for training with live weapons. However, the cost is such that nowadays the squadron pilot is strictly rationed in this sort of thing. Well, the Buccaneers will attack that radar tower and the cluster of surrounding vehicles. There's a mock convoy of vehicles in line ahead for the Harriers. All these vehicles were destined for the scrapyard anyway, of course, and there's a similar convoy for the Phantoms. This is an exceptionally high concentration of targets. Normally, they would be spread around on several ranges throughout the UK. But now, in comes the first Harrier to fire two pods, each of 18 SNEP rockets the pilot aiming visually using head-up display. Air Commander Pete Taylor, the AC of number one squadron, opens the attack 
and is immediately followed in by his number two. Approach speed 450 knots, 10 degree dive from 600 feet, and a devastating attack. The inevitable result of uh, high explosive strikes. The third Harrier lining up his gun sight on target to fire his two 30 millimeter eight guns. And that's the result of 1400 rounds a minute of shells. flown by Flight Lieutenant Pete Martin. And here's the Phantom target, four aircraft to attack it with the almost unbelievable Vulcan gun. This is literally a six-barrel Super Gatling, electronically controlled, and firing 6,000 rounds a minute, or if you prefer it, 100 rounds per second. Approach speed, 450 knots. Now just listen for that gun. There is its devastating objectives. Second Phantom flown by Major John Callum. The convoy already destroyed at the front, which would of course have stopped it if it had been on the move. Brilliant white lights are the strike of the cannon shells. And now Flight Lieutenant Alec Nicholson coming in to complete the attack. And a long burst rips destructively through the entire length of the column. But now the Buccaneers tower and uh, surrounding car park awaiting the impact of four pods, each of 36 two-inch rockets, from each of three aircraft, and this is a pretty powerful punch. You see what I mean? Second Buccaneer lining up from 700 feet in a 10 degree dive at 450 knots. And one to come by Flight Lieutenant Bob Williams, the inevitable result again of this kind of strafing attack. Lining up the site. Well, of course, it's enormous fun to scream out of the sky and clobber a target, but let us all profoundly hope, as they do, that none of these young men ever have to do it for real. But should they have to, there is the evidence that they can and they would. And our next aircraft will be the newest recruit to the service, the BAC Dassault Brigade Jaguar, tactical support and reconnaissance fighter, to drop six 1,000-pounders in what is called the retarded mode. 1,000-pounders, of course, are only one of the weapon options which this aircraft offers. It is clearly going to be a very powerful addition to strike command. Supersonic aircraft, of course, Mark 1.6 at 36,000 feet, but here it will be making a slow run in at a mere 500 miles an hour. The six bombs will form a 220-yard stick, and the parachutes will allow the aircraft at 400 feet to escape the blast. Bombs gone. A direct hit and a 300-yard swathe of total destruction. And here's the tank target for the Vulcan and its formidable load of 21 1,000-pound high-explosive bombs. A parachute retard drop again from 500 feet and 300 knots for a deadly, accurate approach. Aircraft lining up on it now. And 
that thick, acrid smoke of high explosive and fire literally closes the curtains on our glimpse of what the Royal Air Force could do today in anger, merely with conventional weapons. But uh, to deliver attacks like that accurately, you need PR information. PR, perhaps I should say, is standing for photographic reconnaissance in this case. And here comes the film, uh, already processed, enlarged, and printed from the Harrier photographic reconnaissance of Cranwell. And uh, here's a very fit-looking officer, Flight Lieutenant Derek Danahi, Wing Commander Bunny Warren's navigator. He looks pleased with the results, Ray Davenport. Oh, well, we'll check. Uh, Wing Commander, good evening. Did you have a good trip? An excellent trip, yes, indeed, Raymond. Um, can we see your photographs, which is the object of the exercise? What's that? Uh, this is the local village church of Vaitsa, a few miles from our base, and the photograph was taken a couple of minutes after takeoff, uh, with the church clock showing ten past seven. The poet would have preferred ten minutes to three, but never mind. Ten past seven tonight, right? Ah, Cologne Cathedral, uh, you got that. What was the weather like over Cologne? Rather hazy, uh, but uh, sunny, and um, no rain or any problem like that. Well, then you uh, made the long run into Birmingham, and by our calculations, you were there bang on the second. No margin of error at all, which must please you. Yes, uh, these aren't exactly our normal targets. We don't go for churches, cathedrals, and TV studios, but uh, a very good exercise in timing, as you say. We see the car park is very crowded at Pebble Mill there tonight. Thank you very much, Wing Commander Warren, and congratulations. Well, now, let's see what uh, Squadron Leader Jack Pugh's got for us. There's Cranwell, all right. Did you have a good trip, Squadron Leader? Yes, I did, thank you. A lovely evening for it. And uh, were the aircraft on the runway ready for takeoff? Can we yes. see them? Yes. There they are on the western end of the runway, the sun behind. And then they hadn't taken off, but now they have, and they're with us. Thank you very much indeed, squadron leader Jack Pure. And uh, here come those same 16 jet provosts, led by squadron leader Roger Austin, each flown by an instructor, and sitting alongside him, a pupil, a squadron pilot of the future. And uh, also, this is a memorable moment for acting pilot officer Steve Wilkin of the University of London Air Squadron, whom we watched in the Bulldog. He has been congratulated on his first RAF flight by the Chief of the Air Staff, no less, Air Chief Marshal Sir Andrew Humphrey. Well, it seems that the RAF has had no difficulty in bridging that particular generation gap. And that, too, is more than just a coincidence. Personal relationships based on mutual confidence and respect are a tradition of the service. It is these, above all, which make it possible for the Royal Air Force to maintain its skywatch in our defense.